Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another National Press Club Morning Newsmaker. I'm Ed Schaefer, a member of the Morning Newsmaker Committee. Today's guest is Dr. Gurmit Orlok, President of the Council of Khalistan. Dr. Orlok is with us to discuss progress made by the Sikhs in their struggle for independence from India and provide his view of the implications which he believes will come about as a result of the assassination of former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Mr. Orlock received his doctorate from Howard University and served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. He authored over 25 scientific papers and has collaborated with members of the National Cancer Institute in viral research. Welcome to the National Press Club, Dr. Orlock. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to be here, and uh, I thank the Morning news uh, Newsmaker Committee to invite me to bring the situation, what is happening in the Sikh homeland, Khalistan, and uh, about the oppression and persecution of the Sikhs by the Indian government. First, I would like to give you a brief history of the struggle for Sikh freedom and then move on to the re more recent developments in India and Khalistan. The Sikh nation took birth in Punjab. The Sikhs ruled Punjab from 1765 to 1849 when the British came and annexed our homeland. At that point, Sikh rule extended well into present-day Pakistan and past Kashmir. According to the records, the British faced a formidable Sikh army and almost failed to conquer our land. The Sikhs were the last nation on the subcontinent to fall to British expansionism, and we were the first to raise the cry for freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, my point is this, the Sikhs were recognized as a distinct separate nation on the subcontinent, a distinct separate power independent unto itself and a sovereign nation with its own independent political system. In 1947, when the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent won its independence, from the British colonial rule, the British understood this fact and negotiated the transfer of power with the three distinct separate groups, the Muslims, the Hindus, and the Sikhs. At that time, the Sikhs first opposed the partition of the subcontinent, which was to emerge out of the differences between the Hindus and the Muslims. But seeing this as inevitable, the Sikhs did what they thought was the next best thing and joined with the majority Hindus, foregoing the opportunity to reclaim its own sovereign independent homeland, Khalistan. The Sikh nation agreed to this with the solemn assurances of Gandhi and Nehru that no constitution would be accepted that was unsatisfactory to the Sikhs. I quote Jawaharlal Nehru, who said, the Congress assures the Sikhs that no solution in any future constitution of India will be acceptable to the Congress. That does not give the Sikhs full satisfaction. And let me repeat that no solution in any future constitution of India will be acceptable to the Congress, that does not give the Sikhs full satisfaction. Yet, despite such constant promises, in 1950, India ratified its constitution against the expressed disapproval of the Sikh nation. No Sikh leader accepted it. None signed it till today. The state of the state of Virginia, for example, had to first sign the Constitution 
of United States of America before the people of Virginia agreed to become part of the American federal system. The same holds true, you would agree, for Punjab. The Sikh nation never agreed to enter an Indian Union, and the government of India has, since 1947, maintained an illegal control over us. On October 7, 1987, the Sikh nation, to clear up any confusion, formally declared itself independent. The Indian government is an occupying force in a foreign land, and the Sikh nation demands the immediate withdrawal of all Indian military forces from Khalistan and immediate demarcation of boundaries between our two countries. This is the Sikh position, and to say that we have not paid a dear price for justly demanding our God-given right of freedom is to grossly understate the sufferings the Sikh nation has endured under the Indian government oppression. Since 1984, Indian government police, paramilitary forces, and death squads have killed almost 100,000 100, Sikhs. India has repeatedly desec desecrated the holiest of the Sikh shrines, the Golden Temple, and in 1984 led an all-out military attack on the Golden Temple complex and 38 other Sikh shrines which claimed the lives of over 20,000 innocent Sikh men, women, and children. Over 15,000 Sikh, Sikh prisoners of conscience currently languish in Indian prisons without charge or trial. Some for as long as eight years, between 20 to 36 die every day in extrajudicial killings. And according to the New York Times, May 31st, 1990, 20,000 Sikh men and boys had disappeared in the custody of Indian policemen and intelligence agents over the last few years. Just 18 days ago, May 10th, Amnesty International released a blistering report on India's violation of human rights in the Sikh homeland. I quote, thousands of people have been arrested by police and security forces in Punjab. Prisoners have been detained for months or years without trial under the under provision of special legis legislation su suspending normal legal safe safeguards and re uh, reports of torture during interrogation are common the arrests and detention of some detain detainees remains unacknowledged for weeks or months scores of people have simply disappeared the security forces refusing to admit that they had ever been arrested. It is feared that many of them have been killed in custody. Amnesty goes on to say that approximately 400,000 political killings were committed last year alone, the vast majority of victims being six. Ladies and gentlemen, I have made it my life's work to spread the truth about India's brutality against the Sikh nation. I have worked in the U.S. Congress to spread the word and pass legislation censoring India. But now this is the objective voice of Amnesty International speaking. There can be no longer be any doubt that the Indian government is one of the worst violators of human rights in the world at that time, at this time. Let me repeat, there can be no longer any doubt that the Indian government is one of the worst violators of human rights in the world at this time. The only appropriate response of the international community is one of outright condemnation of the Indian government, its laws, and the brutality it so fervently works to sustain. 
Indeed, under the Indian Constitution, the presumption of innocence is reversed to the presumption of guilt. Confession obtained through police torture are routinely admitted in the courts as evidence. Trials can be held in jail cells. The legal remedy of habeas corpus goes unhonored. The identity of witness can be suppressed and a cross and cross examination denied and the accused can be detained up to a year before even being charged with any crime. In a May 10th press release, Amnesty International said, well over 10,000 Sikhs are being held in the state without any charge or even getting a trial under sweeping anti-terrorist laws. Laws which mem members of the UN Human Rights Committee recently called disturbing and completely unacceptable. In its report, Amnesty International recommended that the Indian government takes action to, one, establish an independent body to act upon the reports of abuses, two, prohibit detention in secret centers, three, keep records of everyone arrested, four, conduct a complete review of anti-terrorist laws to make them comply with international human rights standards. Amnesty also urged that allegation of torture, killings, and disappearances be investigated and those responsible for human rights violations be brought to justice. For the part of the Sikh nation, we refuse to sit idly by while the Indian government rapes our women, torture our leaders, and kill our youth. It is only in our own best interest to free ourselves from the oppressive chains of the Indian government as soon as humanly possible. Excuse me. It is, and it is to this end that Colonel Pratap Singh recently announced in Chandigarh the formation of Khalsa Raj Party. Out, outside, you will find a constitutional profile of the Khalsa Raj Party and a copy of the Declaration of Independence of the Sikh homeland. As you will note, the sole objective of the Khalsa Raj Party is to create an independent, sovereign Sikh homeland to be known as Khalistan. As you will also note, the means of Khalsa Raj Party will be democratic, peaceful, and nonviolent. Yet, despite this, the Indian government has already brought a barrage of charges against Colonel Pratap Singh under various draconian laws, including the Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Act, commonly known as TADA of 1985. Colonel Pratap Singh will face the Indian courts on June 3rd, next Monday, if he is charged under the TADA laws, no bail is allowed and he will be incarcerated by the Indian authorities where he will face torture and possibly even death. As far as the Indian government is concerned, Colonel Pratap Singh has no democratic rights under the TADA laws. The presumption of inno innocence is reversed to the presumption of guilt. Confessions obtained through police torture are routinely admitted in the, courts of, in the courts as evidence. Trials can be held in jail cells. The legal remedy of habeas corpus goes unhonored. The identity of witnesses can be suppressed and cross-examination denied. And the accused can be detained up to a year before even being charged with a crime. I pray that Colonel Pratap Singh will survive this ordeal. Many Sikh leaders have perished during it, but I am certain no amount of Indian government oppression will deter Khalsa Raj party and the Sikh nation. As I have said, our ends will be achieved through democratic, peaceful, non-violent means. Civil disobedience, boycott of the Indian government, 
non-cooperation. These will be our tactics. Unity is our strongest weapon against the tyranny of the Indian government. And there is no way India can conduct government in Khalistan if the Sikhs, as a unified body, refuse to participate. India could, however, and don't put it past them, simply kill a few hundred thousand Sikhs, even millions, and hope to solve the issue with violence. It was only a short while ago that a brigadier of the Indian Army threatened to execute the mayors of six Sikh villages, kill all the adult males, confine all the women to army camps, and breed a new race. Doesn't it sound like Germany's Nazi, Nazi Germany's Hitler? Exactly, that's what they were planning. This is the way the Indian government thinks. After the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi last week, the Washington Post reported that Congress politicians often seem to believe that the best way to solve a problem was to beat, beat it into submission. Indeed, for the past decade, the Indian government led by Rajiv Gandhi and the Congress party has been trying to beat the Sikh nation into submission. But we will not submit. We simply want our freedom. However unfortunate the death of Rajiv Gandhi is for India, a Sikh cannot even consider the man without recalling the bloodshed he is so much responsible for in the Sikh homeland and throughout of India. Recall that when Rajiv Gandhi took the helm of the Congress party after the assassination of Indira Gandhi, tens of thousands of Sikhs were murdered by angry Hindu mobs while India, India's government controlled television aired the message blood for blood for three days continuously. Rajiv Gandhi, whatever can be said of his unfortunate death, was the victim of the violence he helped to sustain. India today remains together only by the nexus of oppression of the so-called Indian unity. There is nothing sacred, especially when one considers the immense loss of life it has re required to maintain it. The Sikhs of Khalistan, the Muslims of Kashmir, the Christians of Naga Nagaland, the Assamis, the Tamils, all want freedom from India. Perhaps out of the disaster aftermath of this latest event, Indian politician will understand that the best thing for the subcontinent and South Asia, uh, South Asia will no longer be to force their brutal, death-ridden brand of so-called democracy down the throat of those who stand only to suffer from it, but to truly let freedom ring and honor the independence of those who choose independence. I know the best thing for the Sikh nation is independence. It is our only guarantee for survival. I also know that it is, in the, it is the best thing for the entire subcontinent. India is not a one nation. It is a conglomerate of nations. People call, call it many Europe's. And if it is indeed like many Europe's, it should reflect this reality politically. India is disintegrating, and the assassination of Mr. Gandhi only ex accelerated the process. The nexus of oppression, which has held the parts of India rel reluctantly together for so long, will soon dissipate. India cannot maintain its brutal rule under the increasingly watchful eyes of the international community. It must come to realize that freedom is the best policy, not oppression. Let me repeat this. Freedom is the best policy, not the oppression. And only when India begins to truly understand this, 
the basic fact, will the world begin to see true peace on the subcontinent? Thank you very much. Now I'm open for questions and open discussion. Questions? Well, maybe I'll lead off the sure. question. Sure, sure. If, uh, as you say, there is so much oppression, uh, how do you account for the fact that uh, many of the key positions in the military are occupied by Sikhs? Uh, very interesting question from Mr. Schaefer. And I would like you to just look back. When Hitler killed six million Jews in 40s, he has 38 Jews in very high positions as showpieces to show the world that Hitler is a very secular person. He has got nothing against Jews. So is the Indian government. But you are aware that the, at the time of independence of India, in the Sikh army, 50% of officers were Sikhs, 38% of the Air Force were Sikhs, 33% uh, of the army were Sikhs. But now they only recruit from Punjab, according to the population, 2%. And out of 2%, the share of the Sikhs may be even less than 1.5%. But those people who are there for years, you cannot just expel them. And I can assure you, Mr. Schaefer, the state of the Sikhs in the Indian government, in the army, the Sikh officers are now resigning because they are treated so badly. They are tired and fed up of this discrimination and of this oppression. And as you recall, Indira Gandhi's assassination was not done by any terrorist or militants. They were her own trusted bodyguards, her own bodyguards. And she did not realize the Sikhs are very faithful, brave people. But when you desecrate the Golden Temple, which hurt the psyche of every Sikh all around the world, <laughs> she, she asked for it. And I tell you, the oppression so far, Indian government is responsible for killing well close to 100,000 Sikhs. Sikhs are completely alienated. Sikhs have every right to be free. Sikhism was born in Punjab. Punjab belongs to the Sikhs. Sikhs ruled Punjab. Physically, 95% of Punjab is owned by the Sikhs. And there is no reason whatsoever that Sikhs should be governed by this tyrant Indian government against their wishes. Other questions? No one has a question? Well, I'll try another yeah. one. Could you go over? The, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Would you um, explain to us briefly about the, the circumstances surrounding the downing of an Indian airliner a few years ago? Very, very interesting question. Uh, there is a book here called Soft Target. Can you imagine our CIA blowing up Pan Am? in the air and killing 329 passengers in that aeroplane, no one, no one would forgive the US government or even the president. But that's what exactly the Indian intelligence did. Blew up their own aeroplane, killing 329 innocent people, including women and children and most of them their own citizens by blowing up Air India near Ireland in 1985. And they blamed that, that explosion on the Sikh terrorists. Some Indian government agent called the New York Times or Washington Post that the Sikh militants did it. This book, Soft Target, is written after a thorough long investigation by two reporters, Brian McAndrew and Zuhair Kashmiri from Canada. And they point clearly that it was the work of Indian intelligence. Even the Indian diplomats who were to board the same flight, their seats were canceled only hours before. 
And if you go through the books and be at liberty to take a book, that's why he brought these. That the truth is that Indian government is so brutal, so immoral, such a tyrant, they don't even hesitate to kill their own people to blame the Sikhs in the eyes of the whole world that Sikhs are terrorists. This is contrary to the Sikh beliefs, Sikh religion. We pray morning and evening for the well-being of everybody, the whole world, which includes the Sikhs also. And this, I can assure you, is not the work of any Sikh militants. It was the Indian intelligence. If you recall the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi himself, it was his mother who trained these Tamil militants, supplied them with weapons, tried to destabilize the Sri Lankan government. And then, after training them, after supplying them arms, even in 87, they violated the airspace of Sri Lanka by dropping the supplies uh, by, uh, fr from the air, and then sent 100,000 army to Sri Lanka, which killed thousands of Sri Lankan Tamils, raped thousands of women over there. And I think the investigation is on. They have arrested one woman yesterday. And when it, the truth comes out, I think that woman who was on a suicidal mission, she must have been raped by the Indian Army soldiers. Her family must have been wiped out. You don't do these kind of acts unless you are so frustrated, you are so tired, you don't see any other avenue. And the, the truth shall come out. And it happened in South. I mean, death is, not, is it's a sad occasion. But had it happened in North, by anybody, I can assure you, in 1984, 20,006 were murdered right under the nose of Rajiv Gandhi and Indian government in Delhi alone and other 20,000 th throughout India. This time, they might have butchered quarter million of six throughout of India. We are happy that that mag uh, genocide of that magnitude did not happen because it happened in South India. And this is not the first time the assassination of a political leader has occurred. Mahatma Gandhi, who was more revered than Rajiv Gandhi, he was killed by a Hindu fanatic in 1948. Not even a single Hindu was killed. Now he is again killed by the Tamil. They are Hindus too. 20 or 30 people in uh, riots are killed. But when a Sikh bodyguard killed the Prime Minister, his mother, 40,000 people were killed and slogans were aired on government-controlled television, blood for blood, and they disarmed the uh, police. Police was watching those <laughs> murders, rapes, burning of the Sikhs alive, and did not do anything. How could you imagine the Sikhs can even think that they can live as equal citizens in a so-called secular India. There is no secularism in India. India is, India is a Hindu country. They want to make India the 82% of the population are Hindus. They want to make India a Hindu country with a Hindu language and name it as Hindustan. Well, let me try one more. Sure. If uh, I understand that uh, considerable agriculture and production comes from the Sikh segment of India, and if this is true, what will happen to India if Sikh withdraws as a uh, independent nation? Very good question. Sikhs are very hard-working people, very hard-working people. They get up in the morning, pray, then they earn their living with their own hands and share with the needy. It is because of our religious belief that the Sikhs produce 73% of total Indian wheat reserve, 48% of total Indian rice reserve, and 26% grass national product of India. We are only 2% of the population. India is not helping us to do this, but it is 
in our system built in religiously to work for, with your own hands for living. When Sikhs get freedom, and we hope they negotiate that freedom peacefully, that the things don't go too far, that we are not at speaking terms for hundreds of years. We are neighbors. After Sikhs get freedom, we know Kashmir is going to be free. We know Assam is going to be free. We know Nagaland is going to be free, who is, who are 80, where 80% 80 of the people are Christians. They are fighting for their freedom for last 30 years, and nobody knows about it. They have killed over 100,000, well over 100,000 Christians in last 30 years, and nobody even knows it because Indian government controls the press completely. And uh, after the independence, like European economic market, on the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, we can have Asian economic market in which Khalistan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and we will ask all new countries, Assam, uh, South, everybody, and India to make a Asian economic market with a free trade, and we can give that uh, uh, surplus food, food grains to India, and uh, in return have good trade, buy things from them. And we want peace and cooperation. But this kind of tyranny, how far the Sikhs are going to, to work as slaves of the Indian government to feed them, Sikhs are going to boycott the Indian government. This non-cooperation movement is coming. That was the reason Colonel Pratap Singh declared this Khalsa Raj party. And the sole objective of that party is independent Khalistan. And the means of achieving that what democratic, peaceful, nonviolent. Any further questions? Well, it seems, Doctor, that you've covered everything so well. There's no questions. So we thank well, you for Mr. coming and Mr. we thank all of you for coming. Mr. Schaefer, thank you very much, and thanks yes. everybody. And we